Okay, so as always, let's do a recap of where we stand um, and what we had just gone over in lecture three, uh, the previous lecture. So you did your quantitative assignment. So a lot of this should have clicked by now, um, but if it doesn't, you know, you got you got some time till the, the midterm. So uh, let's do, I think, 10, 15, and you get it on 10, 12. Um, so you got some time. Um, but anyway, let's let's jump in. So I started by defining what economic cost meant. Um, specifically, economic cost is the sum of your explicit cost and your opportunity cost. Okay, and you know, explicit cost was the dollar sign that you usually associate with um, things costing things, uh, things costing money, right? Opportunity cost, though, was I said uh, the utility from the best of your foregone choices. So if you go on a date, um, your explicit cost will be, um, or let's say you get, uh, yeah, you go on a date um, and you had other options. You, you could have you could have gone on the, another date with someone else that that same day, um, but you didn't. The explicit cost would be the cost of the date. Um, so maybe it costs you a hundred bucks for that date. Um, the opportunity cost would be the benefit you would have gotten from going out with the other person, the person that you didn't go out with. Um, that is your total economic cost, and that's what you need to factor in when you're making a decision. If um, you're presented uh, you know, two options, you could, go on, um, you could go on a date with one person, um, you could go on a date with another, and the explicit costs are different, that's not going to really make up your mind. Uh, you want to know, like, who's the better person, too. Like, and you want to factor that into the decision-making. So it's not always about monetary price. Opportunity cost matters a lot. Um, and, there, you know, it might be the case that uh, the date gives you more utility than the explicit cost. Maybe... Um, Maybe your willingness to pay for the date, which again is a problematic use of, the, of that terminology, but maybe maybe your the utility that you would have gotten is equal to the same utility you would have gotten from $120, but your explicit cost is $100. So if you're just looking at explicit cost, you would say, okay, this makes sense to go on the date because I'm getting more utility than I'm paying. Um, but then let's say the other person um, wants to go on a cheap date um, like we go to McDonald's or something for ten dollars, and she gives you, uh, you know, utility of a utility equal to the same utility you would have gotten from a um, hundred dollars, right? So even though the first date makes sense, um, even though the utility is greater than the explicit cost, it would make sense to go on the other date because the opportunity cost is high. Um, and the explicit cost is low. So if you balance the two things, it might make sense to consider the second date, the other date, because the total explicit cost and opportunity cost um, is less for that case than it is for the, the first date. Um, and that's just a way of just thinking about, um, you know, decisions aren't static. Um, every decision you make usually leads to a decision that you didn't make, your opportunity cost. So you know, when you're making a decision, you have to you have to consider that. Um, that's the you know the true way of getting at the the weight of your decision. I realize because I'm Italian, I've been talking with my hands like this. So apologies. Uh, you might see me do that. Whatever. Um, so economic costs. When we talk about costs in this course, we are um, you know in the background we're weighing. Explicit costs and we're weighing opportunity costs. Both of those things matter. You know, it's it's different from your true accounting cost, which would just be your explicit cost. Same thing with economic profit, which I didn't really formally define in the slide, but it's the same thing. Um, economic profit will uh, take into account opportunity cost. Um, so if if something's economically profitable, basically what you're saying is uh, like your accounting profit minus your economic cost is greater than or equal to zero. Um, whereas if something's, you know, profitable in the accounting sense, all you're saying is that the profit is greater than the explicit cost. So economic profit will also subtract out opportunity cost. And this 
kind of comes into play later when we're talking about um, suppliers and like perfect competition, which again we haven't really defined yet, but we will later in this um, later in the slide deck. Um, but when I say that um, a company is not profitable um, in perfect competition, it doesn't mean the same thing that it would in accounting uh, that it does in economics. To be uh, an unprofitable company in economics means that um, your explicit cost plus your opportunity cost is exactly equal to your revenue. Okay, your your what the money you're making. So the money you're making it can still be greater than your cost explicitly, but your opportunity cost also matters. Um, so basically, for a particular firm who might might have, you know, quote unquote, accounting profit, who might be making, you know, $30,000 a year, or like, let's say an individual who's making $30,000 a year um, and expending 15000 yeah, they're making accounting profit, they're, you know, they're adding to their savings account. Um, but if the choice was between two jobs, one that pays $30,000 a year and um, one that pays $45,000 a year, they're actually not profitable because, you know, their opportunity cost is high. Um, so in that sense, they'd rather move out of um, supplying their labor. Um, or, if, you know, if it's a, if it's a company uh, that's making uh, accounting profits so they're making, they're posting some sort of profit accounting wise, um, you know, they could be in a different industry and be making more money. So they might exit the, 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 exit the industry that they're in. And that's that's what we mean by economically it's unprofitable because even though the explicit cost is greater than, or is less than their revenue and they're making actual dollars, uh, they should actually leave the market if the opportunity cost is high. Okay. Uh, and one, one other, sorry, I, I want to give another example about it. Economic cost, um, in, in one other framework, just to, you know, hammer it home. So if we're talking about the Marshall and Kendrick example, um, we said their opportunity cost, let, let's see Marshall. Marshall's opportunity cost of one song was seven cards. Um, and so that's his opportunity cost. You can add to that his explicit cost. Let's say it costs him, you know, $50 of recording, um, recording fees or renting the studio or whatever. So if you're if you're talking about Marshall's true economic cost, it'd be you know the utility of fifty dollars uh, of explicit cost plus the utility of that he would get from the profits of seven cars. Okay, that would be his true economic cost for um, you know for his producing one song. Okay, then I defined the production possibilities frontier, which I'm going to use the pen here for a second. So production possibilities frontier basically gave you two goods. We'll call them one, we'll call them G1 for good one, and G2 for good two. And I said goods, but it could be services. Um, in the original homework uh, before this uh, semester, I actually was using uh, 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 an example from comic books. Uh, Luke and Danny are Luke Cage and Danny. Um, I'm blanking on Danny's last name. Uh, Iron Fist. L L Luke Cage and Iron Fist. Uh, they were heroes for hire in, in the comics. Um, Danny Rand. Sorry. Um, so anyway. Uh, it could be services too, it doesn't have to be goods, but I think goods is kind of easier to think about, so I did change it to goods this time around. But um, in, in, your, um, in your test, it'll be services, I know that for a fact. Um, so you got two goods or services, or it could be one good, one service, but two things that they're producing, right, is a production possibility frontier. Um, and it's just a list of all the things that they could possibly produce. So if it were like this, everything under this line is things that they could possibly produce. And that's what I mean by feasible. So if you take um, Marshall, 
He in one day he can produce seven songs. Uh, sorry, seven cars. That was a good one. And in one day he could produce one song, or he could split up, do twelve hours for to make three and a half songs, and or sorry, twelve hours for three and a half cars and half a song or something like that. But it's just a way of mapping the possible units of production, the possible uh, combinations of good one and good two that a person or two people or, you know, however many people can make. So um, I said that, you know, in one day he can write seven or make seven cars or write one song. Um, so any combination below, whether it's zero, zero, or it's, let's say, five, zero, or, you know, one, one, or something like that, they're all possibilities that Marshall could make. He can make less than um, his most efficient number of songs. He can, you know, spend his time eating Cheetos and sitting on the couch or whatever and just not, not write the songs. Um, so those are feasible. He can do it. Feasible means you can do Oh, sorry. Those are feasible. He can do it. Um, but I said that they were inefficient and in that he's not really using up his time. So everything along this line, the production possibilities frontier, um, we said was both feasible and efficient. Okay, and everything above this line is infeasible. He can't make 10 songs because he's only got, in this case, one day to make, or sorry, he can't make 10 cars because in this case, he's only got one day to make cars and he makes seven cars a day. Um, he can't make two songs because he only makes one song a day and he's got one day. Okay, and I understand in the in the example on the slide, I thought they, I think they might have had seven days or four days or whatever. But um, for this for this example right here, it's just one day. Um, so in terms of coming up with one individual person's production possibilities frontier, we just needed to find the intercepts. So the max he can make in like the allotted time of good one, the max he can make in the allotted time of good two, and then it's just a straight line for one person. Okay, this is one person. Ooh, my handwriting is garbage on whiteboard. So that doesn't say one Persian, it should say one person. Um, but the, uh, the, the production possibilities frontier for one person is very easy. It's just you find the two intercepts, um, you got to label the goods, and it, it doesn't really matter what axis you label the goods on, except that um, in homework I usually give you what axis I want on the what what good I want on the x-axis. And again, I say good could be surface. Okay, so it's just a straight line connecting the two intercepts, and then the slope will be the rise over run. So you can just change, take the change in y, which is your intercept y, y intercept minus zero over your change in x, which is zero minus your x-intercept, and you get your slope. And I said the slope is going to be the opportunity cost of the x-axis good, in this case good 2. So the slope is opportunity cost. Um, so the number of good 1 that you have to sacrifice to make good 2, and the economic reasoning behind that is um, if I move, if I make one more unit of good 1, uh, sorry, good 2, I'm losing some units of good one. So if you're run, the, the change in X, your change in X is one. So if I'm foregoing one more unit of, or sorry, if I'm making one more unit of good two, I'm foregoing the change in Y units of good one. Okay, so I'm going down change in Y some, some level. And that change in Y is your opportunity cost. It's the, the units you forego of good one to make good two. Okay, so again, one person, you just need the two intercepts, and then you can just take the, the change, the slope, as uh, your opportunity cost of the x-axis good. Um, and the production possibility frontier in general is a means of, connect, of plotting your production possibilities, the number of things you can produce for, uh, you know, two sets of goods or... In, in this class, there's going to be two sets of goods. In, in general, it could be multiple sets of goods. Okay, so it's a line that represents the feasible and efficient production of two goods in this case. Um, but your production possibilities frontier, even though I drew uh, these guys here, doesn't have to be 
uh, for one person. And when I did the uh, Marshall and Kendrick example, I did, um, you know, I did them each individually, and then I did them combined. So here's the, one person's individual, and a second person's individual will be the same thing. You find the, the intercepts, you, you draw a line between them, um, and then you find the slope, and that's the full extent of your um, production possibilities frontier. For two people working together, they're going to have two opportunity costs, because at a point of complete specialization, the opportunity cost changes. Um, and just a refresher, what's the point of complete specialization? Um, actually, let me take that a step back. Okay, so there's two people working with two opportunity costs. You're going to get a production possibilities frontier that looks like this. So you find one point, the x-intercept, or sorry, this is the y-intercept, this is the x-intercept. I shouldn't have done this little guy here, I'm just a bad drawer. Um, so you find two points, and then you have to find a third point, okay, and there's going to be two slopes. So we'll call it S1 and S2. Okay. So basically going from here to here, okay, from here to here, and sorry, I want to define this, G1 and G2. I, I want to make a good habit of labeling all the axes. And this is combined. Yeah, that, that stands for combined. It's not Sean Puffy Combs, you know, P. Diddy. Um, it's, it's combined PPF. Okay. Uh, so for two people, um, you know, we typically specialize in one particular good. Um, so one person has comparative advantage in one good. The other person has comparative advantage in the other good. Um, so they're going to have two different opportunity costs depending on who's doing what. So if they're both producing good one, um, and then you go to producing one unit of good two, someone's got to get, give up a unit of good one, right? And move to good two. And that should be the person who's more effective at producing good two. So the person who's more pro effective at producing good two, i.e. the person with comparative advantage in good two, i.e. the person with lower opportunity cost of good two um, should be giving up one unit of good, uh, sorry, some units of good two, good one in order to produce good two. And so if you're mo moving one unit over and giving up, let's say, X units of good one, the X is going to be your change in Y. If you're giving up X units of good one to go one unit over, you're changing X uh, I shouldn't have used X. If if you're giving up, let's say R units a good one, okay? Because I don't want I shouldn't use X. But if you're using giving up R units a good one and moving over one unit a good two, your slope is going to be R changing good one divided by one changing good two, okay? So your slope is going to be R R divided by one, um, which is if you're giving up one unit a good two. And if you're giving up, um, sorry, if you're making one unit of good two and you're giving up R units of good one, your opportunity cost of good one is R, okay? So for the person who starts making good two, the person with comparative advantage in good two, um, they're giving up R units of good one. So R will be the slope. R is the opportunity cost. Um, so person one, the person with comparative advantage in good two, is going to define the slope here, which will be their opportunity cost of good two relative to good one. I think at this point you should stop the video and uh, just rewatch that a little more slowly because that was it was pretty dense. And I'm going to explain again what all those terms mean, but I did hit you with a lot of terms. But it, you know, just a one quick recap before you do that. You have two slopes here defining the combined production possibilities frontier. Um, at some point, you have a person. So at this point, you have um, both people are making both goods. But at some point, if you wanted to make one unit a good two, 
the person with a specialization in good two has to give up some units of good one in order to make one unit of good two. The amount of goods that he'll give up of good one, the amount of good one that he'll have to give up, we said was R, um, or change in Y. Okay, R is going to be your change in Y. The amount of units he has to give up of good one in order to go one unit over of good two is your slope. It's also the opportunity cost of one unit of good two. So your slope of uh, this piece here is going to be the opportunity cost of the person with comparative advantage in good two. Okay, so it's going to be the opportunity cost of the x-axis good, the opportunity cost of good two for the person with comparative advantage in good two. Okay, because he's the one who starts making good two first. Okay. So I, again, I threw a lot of terms here. Um, so first I said specialization. What does specialization mean? Uh, specialization means that different people are going to have different opportunity costs um, to produce good one and good two. And you're going to want to assign the person with lower opportunity cost of good two to produce good two and the person with lower opportunity cost of good one to produce good one. Okay, so Luke was better at producing bottles because he gave up less um, bottles per mask. And um, Danny was better at producing uh, masks because he gave up uh, less masks per bottle. Another way of saying that is Danny had a lower opportunity cost of masks. Luke had a lower opportunity cost of bottles. Okay. And then I came up with this term comparative advantage, which is, you know, the exact same thing. Comparative advantage means you have a lower opportunity cost in a particular good. So Danny has comparative advantage in masks because Danny has lower opportunity cost in masks. Luke has a comparative advantage in bottles. So um, uh, Luke has a lower opportunity cost in bottles. Okay. He gives up more masks per bottle than he does bottles per masks. Um, so if this here were masks, where Danny has comparative advantage in masks, then this slope is going to be Danny's opportunity cost of masks. So it's going to be the amount of bottles he gives up in order to make one mask. Okay. So if Danny gave up, uh, I think it was 18 over 12 or something like that, uh, bottles for every mask, this slope is going to be 18 over 12. Okay. For every individual, for one mask, he gives up 18 over 12 um, bottles. So the slope is going to be 18 over 12. Okay. So they're going to produce until Danny gives up, ends up with no more time left. When Danny is now producing, now spending all of his time producing masks, and let's say you wanted to split it up so that Danny um, produced only masks and Luke produced only bottles, we're going to be at this point of complete specialization, which is the point at which the person with, like formally the definition of complete specialization is the person with comparative advantage in good one spends all their time making good one, and the person with comparative advantage in good two spends all their time making good two. Okay. So um, at this point, Danny, who has comparative advantage in masks, produce only masks. Luke produced only bottles because he has comparative advantage in bottles. Okay. And let's say let's say the market is particularly favorable to masks, so they need to produce more masks than Danny can produce in four hours. So Luke needs to basically to chip in on making some of the masks. Then at, at the, you'll be at this range, right, where Luke is producing some masks, and up until this point, uh, Luke is also producing some bottles. So for these points, Luke is splitting some of his time on masks and some of his time on bottles. But moving from here to here, Luke is giving up some unit of mass, uh, some unit of bottles, good one, in order to produce one unit of good two. Okay, so at that point, his slope is his opportunity cost, is the opportunity, or his opportunity cost is the slope. He's giving up good one in order to make one unit of good two. Okay. So even though he doesn't start making masks, after Danny is spent, after all of his time is spent 
um, he has to give up some unit of bottles, the change here, the slope here, in order to make masks. So notice that the slope here is flatter than the slope here. Okay, And the reason is Danny should have a lower opportunity cost, this flatter slope, of good two than Luke should because Danny has comparative advantage in good two. Okay, So it should always be the case that the left piece of the graph should be the person's opportunity cost of good two who has a lower opportunity cost in good two. And the writer piece, after this point of complete specialization, should be the opportunity cost of the person who does not have comparative advantage in good two for good two. So the opportunity cost of good two for the person who has comparative advantage in good one. Okay. And then just to wrap it all in a nice little bow, if you're asked to draw a combined PPF, all you really need are three points. You need the x-intercept for what they're working for, what they're so the if they're spending all their time working on good two, okay, that's your x-intercept. You need the y-intercept if they're both working on good one, so you'd add up both of their productions on good one, and then you need this point of complete specialization, okay, which will be um, if you give them each the the good that they have comparative advantage in, okay. So if Danny spends all of his time making masks. Luke spends all of his time making bottles. That's your point of complete specialization. Okay. So those are the only three points you need when you're uh, doing a combined PPF. And then you just find the slopes, which will be the opportunity cost for uh, each person's um, each person's opportunity cost of good two relative to good one for each person, where this will be the person's slope who has opportunity uh, who has comparative advantage in good two. This will be the slope for the person who has um, comparative advantage in the y-axis good good one. Okay. So individual PPF, just the, the, the intercepts and the slope matter. Combined PPF, you need intercepts, slope, and um, at this point of complete specialization. And you just have to add each other's intercepts, basically. So, you know, Danny plus Luke, Danny plus Luke, and this will be... Um, It'll also be Danny plus Luke, but presuming that each person is making only one good. Okay. And then feasible. Also feasible along the lines. Infeasible. Inefficient. Feasible and efficient along the PPF. Um, and this will still be in, in infeasible, so you can't say anything about the efficiency here. Okay. I don't want to show, and now I want to erase. Okay, so I know that the next bullet point will be kind of redundant with what I just said, but let's define everything again. Because um, it's helpful to um, kind of hammer everything home. And it, again, you know, it is recap, so maybe it'd be a little faster, but um, yeah. Okay, so I define comparative advantage, absolute advantage, efficiency, specialization, and gains from trade. So comparative advantage means you have the lower opportunity cost in a particular good. So Danny gave up uh, less mass per bottle. So Danny has comparative advantage in mass than, than Luke did. Luke gave up less bottles per mask than Danny did. So Luke had comparative advantage in bottles. Okay. You should always um, specialize in the thing that you have comparative advantage in. So Danny should start with making the masks. Luke should start with making the bottles. I don't want to see people um, give it to the person who makes. So let's say Luke, in our example, made both things better than Danny did. Okay, He made more masks and bottles per hour than Danny did. That is absolute advantage, not comparative advantage. Okay, I'm getting like John Madden here. But... Luke had absolute advantage in both bottles and masks, but he didn't specialize in masks. The reason being, it's actually inefficient for him to do so. Okay, if if we had our PPF, okay, and we gave Luke masks before bottles, it'd actually end up looking like this. 
Okay, and you know, we'd be, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to draw that. I mean, I did mean to draw that, but that was a mistake. Even if we're producing, ah, come on. Even if we're producing at a point here, like if you if you gave Luke the wrong good first, you'd be you'd have a PPF that would bend inwards. And relative to the actual PPF, so this is the correct one, this is the wrong one, relative to the actual PPF, you have feasible but inefficient outcomes because it's under the line. Okay? So you want to make sure that you give the person who has comparative advantage in a good, you want to start them off with the good that they have comparative advantage in. That's your specialization. Okay, so even though Luke could make more masks per hour than Danny did, by virtue of assigning Luke masks, uh, you're making less bottles as a team. So you want to always assign the person with comparative advantage to do the thing that um, they have comparative advantage in. So if, uh, you know, and, and you don't want to assign it based on absolute advantage. So let's imagine a scenario. Um, you have a high school football team, okay? Let's say it's a, you know, two-person team for simplicity. Okay, one, one person catches balls, he's the wide receiver, and the other person uh, throws the balls, he's the quarterback. Now, let's say it's, it's still a high school team, but um, Tom Brady uh, is on that team. As an adult, like Tom Brady, the current Tom Brady, is on that high school team for whatever reason. Now, he can probably both throw the ball better and catch the ball better than whoever, whoever the other person is, right? But one person has to be throwing it, one person has to be catching it. By virtue of being the quarterback, you can't be catching the ball. As uh, Giselle, his wife, once said after they lost the Super Bowl, my husband can't throw and catch the ball at the same time, which is true, right? His opportunity cost of throwing the ball is the, all the catches he wouldn't make and his opportunity cost of catching the ball is all the throws he's not going to make. So presumably, he has a lower opportunity cost of throwing the ball than he does catching the ball. By that, I mean relative to... Um, you know the the let's say the completion percentage that that he'll he'll have the offensive production that he'll have as a quarterback, he's going to have lower offensive production as a wide receiver, but he's still going to have better production if he were placed in either in those either either position relative to the to his other teammate, his one other person. He's better at both positions, but. Relatively speaking, he's better for himself at being a quarterback than he is at being a wide receiver. And then when you compare that to the other person, you know, the they might be, you know, as good a quarterback as they are a wide receiver. But if you compare the opportunity costs they have, they're probably going to have a higher opportunity cost of being a quarterback than they would a wide receiver relative to Tom Brady. Okay, so a higher opportunity, you'll compare Tom Brady's opportunity cost of being a quarterback to the other guy's opportunity cost of being a quarterback. Okay, where Tom Brady's this great quarterback and probably a decent wide receiver, and the other guy's probably a schlub at both, but um, he's giving up more, uh, his, his opportunity cost for being a quarterback is higher than his opportunity cost for being a wide receiver. Um so obviously you want to give Tom Brady the, the quarterback position. He has comparative advantage in quarterback. Even though he's got absolute advantage in both, he can't be out there throwing and catching at the same time. So you have to give it to the person who makes more throws per catch than the other person makes throws per catch, right? And vice versa, you want to get the guy catching who makes more catches per throw than the other guy makes catches per throw. Okay, so it's about what you give up in addition to just uh, or instead of just your absolute ability to do something. Okay, that's absolute advantage. You want comparative advantage. Okay, so you want to you want to assign people the thing that they have comparative advantage in, and that'll lead to a more efficient outcome. Okay. 
Um, so when you have uh, specialization, when you have people doing things that they're kind of more productive at, and by productive, again, I'm using this pr productivity in, sen in the sense of um, comparative advantage, because as a group, what ends up happening is you become, when, when you... Um, when you specialize, essentially what you're doing is you as a group are becoming more productive. And we saw, we saw this uh, productivity when we did both the Marshall and Kendrick example and the Luke and Danny example, right? The after trade outcome um, at least benefited one person and sometimes benefited both persons without anybody losing, okay? Um, and that's what we call this next bullet point the law of comparative advantage, okay? But um, before I get to that, uh, so basically, you know, both people or at least one person ended up producing more than they did um, in the after trade outcome than they did in the, the working alone outcome, okay? Your, your specialization allows you to produce more because you're not spending time producing something that you're, relatively inefficient at producing. You can kind of shove that off to the other guy. So, um, you know, there, there's some level, let's go with Kendrick and Marshall. Both of them ended up producing more songs or one of them ended up producing more songs. But as a team, they produced more songs than if they just split up the work and did, um, you know, half and half or if they worked alone all together. So they... They ended up producing more songs. Um, we call this like extra songs, the extra production, this gains from trade. Okay, that's the the excess production that you get because you specialize in something. Okay, when two people work together and they specialize in something, there are gains from trade. Okay, um, and then this, this last bullet point, the law of comparative advantage. So basically. Um, when we were looking at the homeworks and we were looking at the lecture, I gave you, uh, I think, I think I gave you three different prices, you know, uh, mass for bottles or mass per bottles or, um, songs per car that they could trade at. Okay. And the first price I think I asked you was somewhere in between their opportunity costs. And when that was the case, both people gained. And then I asked you, uh, one of the person's opportunity costs. And in that case, one person gained, and the person whose opportunity cost was exactly equal to the price did not gain. And then the third case I gave you was the alternate scenario where um, it was the other person's opportunity cost. And again, the person whose opportunity cost it wasn't gained, while the person whose price, whose opportunity cost is exactly equal to price, uh, did exactly the same before trade and uh, working alone and after trade. So we call that the law of comparative advantage. So imagine you had some, let's just say zero to one, okay? Some, or let's say, uh, yeah, zero to one. Oh, uh, sorry, I realized it's cut off a little bit. Let me try it again. Actually, let's do infinity to negative infinity, okay? And we'll call this Luke. And we also have infinity to negative infinity for Danny. Okay. So let's say this is one of Danny's opportunity costs. And this is his other. Or, I'm sorry. Ah, too much. Okay. So let's say this is Luke's opportunity cost for. Um, masks, and this is Danny's opportunity cost for masks, okay? So I, I have a number line here that's their opportunity to cost for masks going from negative infinity to infinity, okay? 
the law of comparative advantage is that between here and, he, and here, between the two opportunity costs, as long as they have different opportunity costs, there exists at least one price that will make both people better off. Okay. So I had said that when I gave you a price that was in between Luke and Danny's opportunity cost or between Kendrick and Marshall's opportunity cost, both people benefited. Okay. So any price from here to here, not inclusive, so any price strictly in between their opportunity costs is beneficial to both. When the price is exactly Danny's opportunity cost, it benefits Luke and does not benefit Danny, but it do Danny doesn't lose relative to no trade. And when it's um, Luke's opportunity cost, it benefits Danny, but it doesn't benefit or hurt Luke. He does the same exact as if he uh, was working by himself. Okay. So basically, if Luke can make uh, 15 bottles per mask, he'd accept a trade of um, 15 bottles per mask, or he'd accept anything lower. He'd accept 14 bottles per mask. Because um, that means he's giving up less bottles for every mask that he gets from Danny. If uh, if Danny's opportunity cost was 10 bottles per mask, okay, Danny would accept anything higher. He'd accept 11 bottles per mask because he's trading the masks. He's giving up the masks. So he'd accept 10 bottles per mask because that means he's getting um, more bottles per mask than he'd make by himself. Okay. So somewhere in between their opportunity costs, there existed a chance for mutual beneficial trade. At exactly their opportunity costs, they could just as well do it themselves without seeing any benefit. Um, and at any point below their opportunity costs, like outside this little range in these two areas here, they're not going to want to accept the terms. So if Danny's, um, if Danny's uh, opportunity cost was, what did I say, 10? 10 uh, bottles per mask. He wanted to accept nine bottles per mask because that means he's getting less than he could do by himself. Okay. So outside of here, they're just not going to accept the trade. Um, yeah. So let me erase this. And then I kind of want to talk a little bit about why this matters. Okay, like why historically? So we established that there are gains from trade, right? When different countries have different um, opportunity costs or different people have different opportunity costs, they can actually be more productive than if they were working by themselves, okay? So like, for instance, the United States might have comparative advantage in finance or financial services, and France might have comparative advantage in, uh, let's say, the arts, okay? So it makes sense for um, the United States to kind of specialize in uh, finance, whereas France would finance, uh, specialize in the arts. Um, and in doing so, we're, we're creating more of each. Um, but it's not always the case that that's great for everybody. Imagine you are in France and you are um, in finance. That would suck, right? Because as France starts specializing in the arts, right, they're going to make more and more of that at the detriment of um, finance, right? So there's going to be less and less finance uh, to produce. And what does that mean? That means job cuts, right? Um, so in most of these... Uh, you know, kind of international trade models. We'll look at, uh, you know, the we'll look at countries as one as having uh, specialization in or comparative advantage in labor, and one is having comparative advantage in capital. So, for a country that has comparative advantage in capital or money, um, you know, like financing things, um, you know, it's it sucks to be in labor that in that case, right? And in like the real world, think about it. So as the United States and China trade, China's um, relatively labor abundant, we call it. It has a lot of labor, a lot of people in China, okay? Um, 
and do it in, in that sense, right? Because there's a lot of people, and this kind of will tie into our market discussion later, but because there's a lot of people, um, the supply of labor is pretty, pretty, um, pretty cheap, basically. So the equilibrium price of labor, the wage, um, is low in China, right? If there's enough people competing, if there's a lot of people competing for one job, um, it's very easy to replace that person, like one particular person. Um, so the, the wage for that job is going to be pretty low. And if the wage for a job is low, um, then things that require a lot of people, like um, like a manufacturing type job, right? Something that's labor intensive, we call it, uh, will be relatively cheaper in China than it is in the United States. So China is labor abundant. Um, so that means they are they have comparative advantage in labor intensive, um, you know, products. Okay, relatively speaking. The United States is capital abundant. We have a lot of cash. Um, so we tend to um, specialize in things that require a lot of capital, things that require a lot of cash. Um, uh, so as if, if people are working, uh, you know, a labor job in the United States, so like a coal miner or manufacturer or uh, like a steel worker or something like that. Uh, as we trade more and more with China, those jobs tend to go away. Um, and it's not, it's not really, uh, I don't want to say it's not anybody's fault because you can create policies that can stop the, the, the flow of trade, but they're in incredibly inefficient policies in general. So, the, I mean, it depends on how you weigh um, efficiency versus like uh, fairness or equity, as we call it, um, and how you define equity, because um, there are other ways to define equity. But you can save the jobs, you can save manufacturing if we completely shut off all trade, but at a very, very high cost to, uh, you know, U.S. industries and, and Probably, in my opinion, at least, it's not worth it. Um, of course, I'm not, I'm not, you know, the son of a steel worker in Pittsburgh. So for me to say that is not, you know, really useful. And like you look at, take a look at Camden. There's a lot of, you know, it's not a lot of that is because Camden was also a kind of heavy manufacturing uh, city. Now there, now that we, you know trade more with not just China, but trade more in general, heavy manufacturing jobs are kind of gone. And the U.S. is making more overall money. Um, and, you know, we're more efficient. We're making the, the, the overall global system is more efficient, but at a cost to certain people. And, you know, maybe maybe the the answer isn't to shut off trade. Maybe it's to um, come with some sort of redistribution uh, program or some sort of re-education program or something like that. Um, you know, I'm not going to say what my personal views are. I guess I did say that it, it was a high cost, a high, high cost to efficiency, but um, you know, in general, I try not to give my personal views. But at any rate, whatever the the policy prescription is. You have to recognize that there is an efficiency trade-off whenever, um, you know, whenever you shut off international trade because you're essentially shutting off these international specializations. Um, so the, it does really matter in the real world. And we can also kind of see that in countries who did shut off international trade. So, uh, you know, you have a wave of countries in the late 70s, early 80s, um, and you'll see this in the Commanding Heights documentary if you watch it, who kind of went through this pattern of what's called import substitution industrialization, where they tried to basically grow their in industries, um, uh, you know, outside of the confines of international trade. So they shut off their, they shut out their borders and they tried to increase government spending into individual in industries as an investment. 
Um, and it was kind of a disaster. So the government just ended up in debt and all this. Um, and the reason is because they didn't have, they never really had the, the comparative advantage. They never really had the specialization and the, the resources needed to, to be able to do that. Um, so, you know, the, but the, I guess the, the overall thing is that if you're looking at, um, or sorry, I kind of lost the thread here, but, uh, these, these countries, essentially what they're trying to do is they're trying to change their pattern of production, change their comparative advantage and their opportunity costs so that they can actually change the, the, the price of their comparative advantage good for the, the um, let's call it the West comparative advantage good. So they were trying to basically move the price, the international price, away from their opportunity cost and more towards the other person's opportunity cost or the other country's opportunity cost. Um, you know, and, and this system didn't end up working out for them, um, but, or not but, the system didn't end up working out for them uh, because they never really had the specialization to begin with. Um, so yeah, this, this matters in the real world. It matters a lot. And it matters to you in particular you know, people from New Jersey, people from Pennsylvania or wherever you're from. Um, Cause a lot of these industries that are labor intensive are being hit and they're being hit in our communities. Um, and you know, it's not necessarily the answer that you shut off trade, um, but at least you should know why, why it's the case and why we might not want to shut off trade and, and understand kind of the, the dynamics and the patterns behind that. So if you're, a laborer in a country that specializes in capital, um, you know, that, that has real effects on your life.